Okay, it's two minutes after one and we will get started. Hi everyone, my name is Xiaohan Bao Smith. I'm the Historic Properties Coordinator of the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We are very excited today to have the uh, have our speaker Lindsay Dobson from Main Street Charlevoix to talk about preservation on Main Street Charlevoix today. And before I turn it over to Lindsay, I would like to go over a few items. First, um, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box as you think of them. And please feel free to use a chat box to share any thoughts and resources. Both the Q&A and chat boxes are located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you don't see them, please wiggle your mouse. And please participate in the survey after the webinar concludes. If this is your first time attending our webinar, we are the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We advocate for Michigan's historic places to contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We could not do the work we do without our members and volunteers. If you are not a member yet, please consider joining us at www.mhpn.org. This webinar is supported in part by an award from the Michigan Arts and Culture Council. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Lindsay. Um, Lindsay is the Main Street DDA Director for the City of Charlevoix. She has a master's degree in historic preservation from Eastern Michigan University and obtained her bachelor's at Grand Valley State University. Lindsay is a certified Main Street America revitalization professional. And prior to arriving in Charlevoix in 2016, she had worked in two other Michigan Main Street communities, totally over eight years of experience in downtown management. Lindsay has a passion for downtown walkability accessibility use engagement in placemaking and historic building in built environment. She volunteers as a member of the Charlevoix Historical Society Board and serves as the Buildings and Grounds Chair. She also is a staff advisor for the City of Charlevoix Historic District Commission. She loves living up north with her husband, her son, and two cats and chihuahua. Hobbies include enjoying the outdoors and doing hands-on restoration work with historic masonry and wood windows. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you. All right, so let me make sure. One moment, get my presentation going. Of course, we practiced this ahead of time, and I thought I found a trick, but it did not work out. So, oh, well. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, I have been kind of spying on the attendance window to see how many familiar names I see, but I do see a few that I am not familiar with. So I would love to see in the chat um, where you are tuning in from. Um, and perhaps whether or not you've been to Charlevoix before, because that'll be fun to know. All right, so that introduction was pretty thorough, so I don't think I need to cover anything more about myself. But I do want to start out by talking about um, my past and history in general and um, the kind of the motivator behind the work that I do here. Um, I am not from Charlevoix. I moved here in 2016 for this position, um, but I did have a grandfather that was from here and an aunt that still lived here when I was growing up, so I did get to visit quite a bit when I was a kid. Um, so that was pretty much all I knew about my family history here. 
Um, some of you who may know uh, know me know that I'm also uh, married to another preservationist, Trevor Dotson, um, and he works at the Charlevoix Historical Society and is very, very great at <laughs> genealogy research. And so when we moved here, um, he started to dig a little deeper into my family history and discovered that it goes quite a few generations back. Um, and some of my ancestors were considered pioneer settlers, white settlers, obviously, um, of the Charlevoix, uh, the greater Charlevoix area. So I, it was, it was fascinating to learn this after moving here. Um, and, uh, to make it even more interesting, we then found old plat maps that, um, identified some land that some of my ancestors owned. And this map in particular is very interesting. And obviously, um, my design skills are lacking here, but <laughs> the blue dot is actually where our home is that we ended up purchasing here. And the red squares um, that is now state land um, as part of Fisherman's Island State Park was once owned by um, James and George O'Brien, which were great, great uncles of mine, which is pretty interesting. Um, so all of this to say, when I look at our downtown in Charlevoix, I really want to honor <clears throat> the, the downtown that was here when my ancestors used this place uh, as a place of commerce. And, you know, there has been a lot of changes in Charlevoix that would make it pretty much unrecognizable at this point um, it, to someone if they were to, you know, come like travel forward in time, they might not recognize that that this is still Charlevoix, aside from the water and all that fun stuff. Um, this is a picture of my grandpa. Um, he's the one on the right with a banjo. Um, and, and honoring his legacy um, is part of the reason why I'm so passionate about the work that I do. <clears throat> so essentially, you know, we all we all are passionate in the preservation world about the built environment and the stories that buildings can tell. Um, in the description for this presentation, it was mentioned that we have a few designations. So I do wanna go over what those are and what they mean because I'll be referring to them throughout the presentation and how we've utilized these um, resources. So we are a master level Michigan Main Street uh, program and we're accredited by the National Main Street Center. Um, the Main Street program is preservation-based economic development. It was started uh, with um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So the Main Street program really is preservation-based, um, not just, you know, festival planning and um, placemaking initiatives. The ultimate goal is the preservation of those um, traditional downtowns. Um, the Certified Local Government Program through the National Park Service is um, a designation that we mo probably, I think it was two years ago that we uh, became a CLG and um, we did get assistance to become a certified local government through Michigan Main Street because they awarded us um, a consultant that helped us through that process. And I was very thankful for that help. Um, but really what it is, is a formal commitment to preservation um, by engaging in the partnership with SHPO, which is the State Historic Preservation Office, um, to plan for effective preservation strategies. Um, and that has been extremely useful, especially with the, the, the hiring of Alan Higgins at the State Historic Preservation Office. If you haven't had the pleasure of working with him yet, um, he is definitely a good hire for them because he's been great to work with so far. Um, and then we also have the certified, we're a certified redevelopment ready community. Um, and we obtain that with assistance from a CEDM fellow, which is a program uh, through this, the Community Economic Development Association of Michigan to help communities become redevelopment ready certified because there's a, a capacity issue with most places that are trying to obtain this status and, and they acknowledge that. So we took advantage of that program and thankfully got certified last year. So really what that does is um, puts it out there that we are offering a transparent and predictable and efficient development experience. And of course, preservation is very much a part of um, 
that transparency and, and the planning that has gone into a lot of the stuff that we're doing. So one of the, um, I, don't, I don't even know what they call them now, but one of the guiding principles of any Main Street program is really driving home that any change that's going to happen is going to be incremental. And I was reviewing an old presentation from, I don't even remember what year, but I was a um, opening plenary panel speaker at an MHPN conference. And I was talking about preservation in, in Charlevoix at that time. It must have been 2018. And I was <laughs> looking at one of those slides and I listed all of the resources that were possible for a community to utilize and essentially was saying, look at all these things that we don't have. Like we, these are tools that we do not have in our toolkit. So a few short years later, we are definitely uh, making progress. And, and it's been, it's, sometimes it feels like it's a long haul for sure, um, but it's actually amazing when you stop and think about the progress that has been uh, accomplished. So one of the very first things that we started when I came to town um, and also knowing that generally speaking, preservation wasn't um, a concept or a word that we uh, really welcomed with open arms here. Um, so there are some enthusiasts and always have been, but generally speaking, the property owners, um, uh, commercial property or owners in the downtown haven't always been convinced that it's a good thing. So um, the incremental change is definitely a way to kind of ease that piece of um, economic development into conversations to a point where people start to really grasp onto um, and get excited about historic preservation. And that's what, something that I think we've accomplished. So the first program was creating a facade grant program that helped um, <clears throat> restore slash preserve some historic um, storefronts. We awarded over $60,000 in grants and um, was able to help 11 different projects throughout the course of that program. It no longer exists. We don't fund that program anymore. Um, it was just a, a budget kind of decision that had to be made, um, but it did uh, lead to a lot of great progress. And I have a few before and after photos that some people may have seen, um, but simple changes, uh, with the assistance of historic photos has uh, made some of our properties that are historic but maybe had been altered a little bit over time uh, be a little more historically accurate and definitely more appealing. So um, here's an example that I, I use often. Um, we had a major fire in 2016 in a historic property. And because we awarded a facade grant to this project, it, we were able to save the building because the contractors that were hired to bring, uh, to you know, basically rehab the, the property after the fire said that it needed to be demolished entirely. Um, and so when we were brought to the table, we were able to work with the property owner to kind of change the course of that conversation and figure out a way that we can keep some of the original material and all of the facade <laughs> uh, intact while they rebuilt the building behind it. And so that was a huge preservation win for us because this is a very prominent uh, building in our, in our very small downtown. So that's what it looks like today, kind of back as good as new and you probably wouldn't even be able to tell that something <laughs> devastating happened there. And that was a, a, pro a, a very long process. This building was not um, inha uh, inhabited. <laughs> it was not occupied for a couple of years as they um, rebuilt after that. So um, another service that used to be available through Michigan Main Street were design services and they stopped uh, uh, offering this service to communities directly 
because there was um, not a lot of um, actual completion or implementation of the suggestions made in the design services. So we were only able to get one of these um, before they eliminated that service altogether. And it was for the building that you see here on the left, which is currently occupied by Round Lake Bookstore. Um, the photo in the middle is the original building. It's called the Butters Building um, because the owner or the builder of the building was Archibald Butters. You gotta love that name. Um, and he was a very prominent figure in Charlevoix, but also in the state of Michigan because he um, eventually served as lieutenant governor of the state. So um, when we discovered all of this really fun history about this property, the um, commercial property owners, and I say commercial because this is a tricky one, um, they only own the storefront portion of the, the building. The rest of it is split into condos that are residential. Um, so they got really excited about that history of Mr. Butters and the impact that he had on our economy and really want to pay like homage to what he did. Um, but financially, it has never made sense for them to make that investment because they're only collecting rent on one unit of that building. So the return on investment is just never going to work out unless someone like rained a pot of money on them, they're not going to, you know, really be able to implement this. So this design service has been sitting around for over five years. And we have behind the scenes uh, just been hoping and praying that something worked out to, you know, move forward with implementation of this uh, restoration of that facade. And the other component that made this really difficult was the fact that the property has a condo association, right? Um, and the association had to agree to even consider moving forward with this because it does impact a bit of the residential with the addition of another window that had been taken away and covered up. Um, but after about four years of uh, kicking that conversation around, the thing that really got the condo association's attention was the potential of tapping into historic tax credits. Um, and so they finally agreed to explore options. And I will talk a little bit um, later about where that project is headed. Some other small steps along the way were the creation of design guidelines, which um, we, we titled the, it that because it's just kind of a, an overarching, uh, you know, normal thing that people call these documents. Um, but we also kind of made it a preservation resource guide. Um, so not only are we, you know, suggesting best practices, but also pointing folks to resources that can help them kind of see these things through. Um, and it's also become a, a really great educational piece on the design of historic buildings and the functions that they served and how simple it really was. Um, and how far we've gotten away from that as we've been able to get creative with design because of modern technology. Um, so it's been a, a great tool and we are working on implementing uh, or actually working this into code for the Central Business District. The Planning Commission has been very supportive in that effort. Um, so essentially we're looking at form-based code um, but that's also a scary word in uh, local government <laughs> if, if you're uh, more traditional like we are. So. so I want to mention that we do have a lot of local incentives that we have built up over the years because, you know, through the process of becoming an RRC certified community um, and among other things, we, we've been building up our toolkit for uh, quite some time and very intentionally. So we have a commercial redevelopment district that is basically um, 
the entire downtown, so our entire downtown development authority district and uh, Main Street district. And this is a tool that we can use to abate the property taxes generated from new investment. Um, and it has been used a lot and they've pretty much only been given to um, historic property owners, which um, part of the scoring criteria is how they're um, preserving the history of the building. We have a downtown housing incentive program. Now this isn't necessarily a preservation based thing, but because we um, as a community have had a shortage of housing units just in general um, for quite some time, even before the national crisis uh, became a thing, um, we are using this tool to try to incentivize the investment in creatively reusing underutilized space. And I'll talk more about how that has um, been awarded to a property that is so exciting and I can't wait to see all of it come together. We also have an alleyway improvement grant, which is a small grant, but um, to improve the back sides of buildings and alley facing um, uh, either sides or backs because of the fact that we're trying to improve the, the alley corridor in general. Um, and this is just another way to spur that private investment in that overall vision. And then we also have a commercial energy efficiency grant, which is basically a rebate, but um, and a lot of uh, municipalities participate in this. Um, so if you're not sure if yours does, you can um, look into it. But is something that I promote to our property owners because simply changing out light bulbs can get them a check cut to them, <laughs> um, but also considering other um, energy efficient improvements. Um, it, it's just it's just another resource that we have to encourage good behavior, right? So, oh, hold on, sorry. One of the benefits of being a certified local government is um, being able to take advantage of, of course, grant funding, which is usually why communities are interested in becoming uh, CLGs. But there are also some intangible um, partnership opportunities like the community partnership program that was created uh, not long ago. And what this is, is really, um, being able to apply for assistance when you don't have the local capacity to do something. So we've been talking about nominating our downtown for the National Register since I started and even before then. And once upon a time, uh, a group of people submitted an application to, to SHPO that was denied because at the time um, they did not have enough contributing resources to substantiate the entire downtown um, being nominated. So then we had a version of the district that was much smaller that we were um, looking to uh, apply for, which was essentially the 200 block of our downtown. And that's the only portion of the downtown that had an, at the time enough contributing resources. Um, and it's also the only part of our downtown that is still two-sided because we lost some buildings um, for the sake of a, our East Park, which is um, the blue area that you see shaded on this map, um, and the city marina. So um, historically not accurate, but the park that's there is beautiful and award-winning, and we love it so much because the views are fantastic. Um, so we were working on um, that smaller version of the historic district for a couple of years, and then when we applied for and got this community partnership program assistance, um, SHPO came and actually determined that we can, in fact, nominate our entire downtown and we have the, you know, the ratio to contributing and not non-contributing structures to, to make it happen. And this was great news because we do have so many great resources and it can also include our drawbridge, um, which is a historic uh, infrastructure related um, piece of our downtown and iconic to say the least. So that's really exciting. And um, the, the State Historic Preservation Re Review Board will have the pleasure of reviewing that application prepared by SHPO for us um, during their January meeting. So um, 
it's it's fantastic because we don't have to go through the the, the tedious process of a district nomination um and we don't have to cross our fingers at the end of the day when we submit that application because the people that are going to approve it are the ones that are doing the work so i would hope that they don't deny their own application but i guess we'll see what happens <laughs> So um, we have a thing here that has long just been a part of our history. Um, in the 60s, there were some folks that wanted to um, apply a theme to downtown Charlevoix, much like um, Gaylord. They adopted like an al alpine theme, right? Um, and we were in the mindset that because we had a French name, Charlevoix, um, that it, we should try to emulate a French fishing village. And nearby Fishtown over on Leelanau Peninsula was probably referred to at some point. And what this theme ended up giving us were a bunch of shingled pent roofs that were placed on front of buildings. And that is as far as that vision went. There are a lot of these suckers that have stuck around since then. And while they're now historic in their own right, um, they certainly kind of got away from that form and function, the simplicity of a commercial building and how it's supposed to just simply sell things. <laughs> um, and so we, um, we've been trying through several avenues to um, see some of these, these beautiful pent roofs just go away and um, there are a couple of uh, success stories coming up, <laughs> like um, most recently, and this is a rough photo, but this was uh, probably a couple of months ago at this point, um, the property pictured, um, here's the historic photo on the left, what it looked like beginning of the year um, on the right, and you can see that they completely removed the pent roofs and the awnings and there was a bay window kind of um, that was added to the second story that you can see there and they weren't sure um, how that was going to go but turns out structurally it wasn't sound so it was easy to get rid of so now they've re-exposed the original design of the building um, including the old sign that <laughs> reads kroger because it was a kroger grocery store in our downtown um, dating back to the 1930s um, and essentially you know the transom windows like all of that stuff had just been covered up and a lot of decorative elements were covered up as well. Um, and so just from taking that stuff off of their building, they were able to make this a contributing resource in our soon to be National Register Historic District. So um, this project has been complex. Um, it, it's a building that recently sold thanks to um, the, the housing market and the real estate market going crazy. Um, a lot of properties that we had had for sale for a long, long time that were way overpriced finally sold because before they were overpriced, but now they're like kind of reasonable um, with the way things have gone in our economy. And so a young couple from downstate bought this building. They have already taken advantage of the tax abatement that they were able to tap into because of the commercial redevelopment district. We also did award them um, a housing incentive grant and they are adding five units, um, housing units to this property because for years and years and years, the former owner of this property had the entire second floor over two storefronts, so that's a lot of square footage, um, and it was used as his office slash studio. And he was an artist, he was an architect, he did many things and great things for this town, including working with the, the guy who designed a lot of the pent roofs. Um, Hans Weimer is his name, it's just fun because he's very German, and <laughs> has the accent to boot. Um, and so when I when he was still the property owner, I I worked, I talked to him several times and I'm like, you know, you don't use your studio that much anymore. Can you at least maybe rent it out to other people? But he was very particular about who he wanted to rent to. Um, 
And I just found myself daydreaming about how all that square footage could have one day been converted into housing since we need it so desperately. Um, and so three act actual condo units are gonna be um, constructed on the second floor. But then the fun thing is that there's gonna be two apartment units added to the basement of this building. And that sounds interesting, right? But that's also square footage in our downtown that is underutilized if it's used for storage and storage only. Um, and so those two apartments that are gonna be under the ground are actually going to be deed restricted to be occupied year round because we do have a very seasonal economy associated with our tourist uh, destination status. Um, and so we're also really putting our money be behind trying to get people to live here year round because they'll spend money in our downtown year round and our businesses will eventually be able to stay open most of the year or all year and jobs will, you know, be year round instead of seasonal. And the trick, you know, the obviously long-term effects of, of a year round unit versus summer occupied only um, is hugely beneficial for our community. So, um, the other uh, fun, exciting thing is that because it this building was made contributing um, just by the removal of the, the stuff that was on the front of the building, they were eligible to apply for the Small Commercial State Historic Tax Credit. Um, and so I worked with them on that to uh, submit, um, and all of us that had anything to do with applying for that are still waiting with bated breath to find out who made the cut. Um, because when that program launched, I'm, I'm guessing the demand was quadruple, if not more, <laughs> what the state put in their budget for that program. But a lot of exciting things happening in this building, and it's definitely already having a ripple effect on its neighboring uh, um, structures. <clears throat> so back to our friend, the Butters building. Um, so one of the things that we were, uh, you know, on the lookout for because of the financial um, I wouldn't say hardship, but just infeasibility of the project as a whole was grant funding um, opportunities that could help move this project along. But because it's not necessarily a redevelopment of the, the property to, you know, bring a maybe vacant or underutilized space into something more, uh, because it's already pretty much full, it, it's been really hard to identify funding resources to make this thing go. Um, thankfully, when our state applied for funding um, to create the Resilient Lakeshore Heritage Grant Program, Alan Higgins at um, SHPO wrote into the rules of that grant that it could actually be used on a historic building that's non-contributing to bring it to a contributing status. So if you've read any version of preservation grants, most of the time, only contributing properties are eligible for funding. And so because we have so many covered up properties, it was also really tricky for us to identify some sort of funding that would apply to a non-contributing to make it contributing. Um, so we were very fortunate that that was a part of how they wrote the rules on that grant. And um, if you're not familiar with it, it's something that was launched this year and is made, has been made available to specific communities that are um, near large bodies of water. So if you're, uh, you know, a traditional downtown that's near water, um, you're on that list, but you also have to be CLG, Main Street, and or RRC to be eligible. Um, so I am happy and thrilled to be working on this grant application on behalf of the property owner and the condo association and crossing my fingers that that $100,000 um, opportunity to bring this uh, building's history back to life will be granted to us. But nothing is um, certain, so I guess we'll see what happens. But it's great when these, when everyone is paying attention to the problems on the ground and come up with solutions to help us um, practitioners really see some goals through. So 
I can't say enough about how, how excited I am about the future of that program. The other great um, assistance that we've been able to receive because of our RRC uh, designation is over time, we in acknowledging the fact that these funding opportunities were coming out of the gate. We were able to engage with the um, MEDC to assist us with something that was really important in seeing this project through. And um, essentially that was estimates on what it would cost today versus the estimates that were given to us back in 2017, because obviously a lot has changed in uh, the building world and um, prices are completely different than they were. Um, so they sent some staff here to take some 3D measurements of the property and then they generated from the design service report um, detailed estimates of how much everything was going to cost. So that really sets us up for success when it comes to applying for funding because Honestly, it was easier to work with MEDC than it would have been uh, working with a local contractor to get this pricing because everyone is so busy. It's so hard to get a call back nowadays. And um, this was actually, you know, probably a, a little more useful just because of the detail that was given to us as well than we would have gotten from a local contractor. So it allows us to potentially break the the um, the project up into phases and kind of piecemeal what we need to do uh, to get that building into a contributing status um, and then, you know, and hope for the best that we'll be able to make the investments to, to round it out because that's definitely going to be a big project. <clears throat> Another thing I want to mention and the resource that we've been able to tap into that is mostly available to everyone in Michigan is the Michigan Community Revitalization Program or MCRP. Um, working with your CAT person through the MEDC is the way you can tap into some of this potential funding. Um, and we have a property owner of the building pictured here that the entire second floor is completely empty and has been for years. Um, and he's working to create apartments of all things, right? Um, on the second floor. And I think I think he has it planned out for um, seven apartments because it's a pretty large uh, building. Um, so working with our representative from the MEDC, we identified that this would be a good program for him to tap into for that. And we have a, a regional, um, the Northern Lakes Economic Alliance group that has been able to help the property owner through that application process because it is certainly tedious as many um, state incentives can seem to be, especially when you're a property owner who works and has a day job um, and really has a hard time sitting down and, and doing <laughs> grant applications, for example. So um, another resource that will thankfully keep this property, you know, historic and also um, fulfill a need that we desperately have here, which is um, more variety and just number of housing units. Another service that we're taking advantage of is the design and build scenario that is a service of the redevelopment ready, um, a redevelopment sites team. They, or services team, sorry. <laughs> There's so many acronyms, it's uh, so hard to keep up on them. Um, so this is a property that is not on our main street, but it is in the downtown. And it used to be a filling station, but has changed use over the years. And isn't necessarily, um, you know, exciting when it comes to how it how it looked even back in the day, um, but it's really great to be able to reimagine. You know how this can be maximized to you know its best use and potential for the square footage that it occupies. Because you notice there's a large parking lot in front of the building. It's not zero lot line, which is you know not traditional for. Um, our downtown, but because it was a gas station, that was necessary as far as the layout is concerned. 
So the property owners are acknowledging that they do want to reintroduce some historic character to the building, but also um, increase the number of housing units that exist here so that they can maximize the the airspace that they have, because um, we can go up to three stories here and you can see that half of the building is only one at this point. So <clears throat> another great project is um, like general design assistance. I didn't know that this was an option when we became an RRC. Um, but when we had an architect here recently to work on that design build service that I just talked about, I, she said, oh, what's, what else is going on? Like, what else do you have going? I'm like, well, we have this building that has been significantly changed over time, had a third story added to it, has the pent roofs. Um, but once upon a time, it was a very simple, historic, beautiful storefront. And the owners actually want to do what they can to bring that history back out into the open. Obviously, we can't do anything about that third story being added, but we can certainly bring back some of that character of the original storefront. And so um, we're going to be working on like a, a I guess, a brief overview kind of design assistance um, with the help of that architect and um, our partners at MML and MEDC um, so that we can start to visualize what th those improvements will entail and hopefully move forward with those investments to um, honor the history of the Pine River building is what we call it because it's right on the channel. <clears throat> also, not that we, this is new information at all, but it's been extremely powerful here. <laughs> Tax credits get people's attention. I always lead the conversation with the potential of tapping into tax credits. I know that that's what they're going to listen to. If I come at them with anything when it comes to saying historic preservation or historic character or like they're not interested, but tax credits talk, money talks, right? So here's a property that was also recently purchased by someone um, after, unfortunately, the, the owner who had it for years and years and years, um, she passed away recently. So the property owner um, now wants to add a third story and condos and an elevator for a rooftop deck and all this fancy stuff. Um, and was going to do that by, they, and they do, they're interested in taking the pent roofs off and making it more historic and all that fun stuff too. But um, I looked at the initial renderings that their architect drew and it had the third story looking exactly the same as the second story. And I'm like, oh, hey, guess what? Um, it, <laughs> according to the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, that addition needs to look similar to the rest of the building, but also be noticeably different because it's a modern addition. You can't falsely represent that this was a three-story building because it was not a three-story building. It was two-story. And so um, when the tax credit kind of came into the conversation, all of a sudden he's like, oh, heck yeah, let's redesign this. I'm going to have my architect start working on this right now so that we can, you know, follow the rules and eventually tap into the tax credits. And I'm like, wow, that was kind of easy. Um, but these types of conversations are, you know, years in the making for sure. But because of the investment that's happening next door at the 211 Bridge Street property um, and potentially across the street with the Butters building, we're going to see um, a major Major portion of our downtown transform in ways that I could not have dreamed of actually happening. <laughs> and it's, it's just incredible that all of this is happening right now. So anyway, I, um, I want to leave time for questions. I know I talked about a lot of different programs. Um, there were acronyms thrown out that you may not be familiar with. And um, I, yeah, I guess it's question time. So go ahead and, and start putting them in the Q&A box. We've actually got um, several questions. Um, yeah, and we, we've got about 15 minutes. So 
Um, let's go ahead and answer it. I will read the question so everybody can hear what people are asking. Okay, the first one I'm seeing is that um, from Gary Wilson said, in Owasso, we are currently dealing with a burned out historic building in the middle of our historic district. The owner wants to tear it down. How did you manage the project to preserve, uh, of preserving the facade of the Cherry Republic building, working with owner, and bracing the facade, et cetera, and uh, who was responsible for the costs? Good question. Um, so this was definitely a tough project all around, <laughs> um, especially after a fire, obviously you're dealing with insurance companies and what they're willing to pay for, depending on the coverage that the property owner has, you get different versions of what those um, expenses can be. And so you have that in that aspect of conversation that that has to take place and, and be sorted out on like on behalf of the property owner they have to be their own advocate but then you're also dealing with um whichever company is hired as the general contractor and in this situation as i mentioned in the very beginning with our building um they determined it unsalvageable and that they needed to demolish it and as soon as i heard that <clears throat> I was like, all right, let's 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 call a meeting with the construction team and let's talk about this. And turns out that was just the easiest thing to do, right? That's, that's the way we roll here. Um, easy, quick, get it done and uh, rebuild. Um, and so that, that conversation changed quickly when we started to acknowledge a couple of uh, key components. One, the facade was structurally sound still. Um, obviously, when they started to demolish parts of the building behind it, yes, reinforcement had to occur. All of this was um, financially the responsibility of the property owner um, through you know, private and insurance money. Um, but also we did come to the table with a $10,000 grant. Um, at the end of the day, that's not that much money, but at least it allowed him to have that foot to stand on or leg to stand on in those conversations with the contractors. No, we are preserving as much of this as we can. And we're going to do what it takes to, um, to essentially, yeah, um, manage the, what we have to work with. So um, the other thing that I often find is when you're meeting with general contractors, rarely are they aware of um, the preservation building code, which is something that applies to our entire state. And there are essentially um, some exceptions made when it comes to the building code for historic properties. And bringing that to the table uh, usually makes you seem like you know a little bit more about their job than they do. Some people get threatened and intimidated by that, and some people perk up and start listening a little bit closer. <laughs> um, but that was also a part of how we were able to accomplish some of the things with that, um, saving that building. So. I don't know if that really answered the question. Fire protection. Um, oh yeah, I see Janet talking about that. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sorry. I'm <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself by reading other <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I will read the question. Okay. Okay. The, the rebuild after the fire was amazing save. This is from Janet. And she said, I can't imagine how many steps that took to bring the building back. And her question is, did it become a precautionary tale for neighbor neighboring property owners? Um, for example, better fire protection and suppression system? It did, absolutely. Um, and that year, that was actually the second major fire that our downtown had within a month. Um, we had a fire that took out almost half of a block um, just one month prior to that one. And then this, so one was near Thanksgiving and the um, Cherry Republic fire was, I think, Christmas Eve. Um, and so the whole town uh, was definitely a little more uh, aware of ways that we can improve um, fire protection. And this also actually filtered into um, our fire departments 
and some of the, the ways that they go about um, inspections and, and checking in on properties. And so some policy was changed after the fires that we had. And um, yeah, it, it, most people, if, if nothing else, actually checked their insurance um, on their property to make sure that they would be covered in something like this. <laughs> So, okay, next question. Um, how supportive is a local banking community? They have a mandated responsibility to invest locally, do they? They do, yes. Um, I would say, you know, we've, we've partnered with our very local bank, Charlevoix State Bank, um, for a couple of things. We were able to award a small business grant to um, someone two years ago for twenty thousand um, dollars, but they also they're they're very reliable lenders when it comes to our small business community. Um, and as far as investments in the community, they do that through a lot of sponsorships and um, event support and things like that. So, okay, there's a comment about um, a French fishing village. Um, the attendee said, "Lindsay, you are a saint to to bear that." Um, conversation while you establish a preservation ethic. Is there anybody um, who still embraces that? Yes. Um, this is, you know, interesting, you know, especially in a small town where everyone knows everyone and there are long histories. Um, there's actually a gen the gentleman that was one of the major um, cheerleaders for our French fishing village theme recently passed away. His name was Jack Begro, and his daughter is very much involved in the community and has recently given presentations about some of the um, buildings that her father helped design. And so she's really kind of paying tribute to his work that I have proactively been trying to do away with. So it's been a really interesting dynamic. Her and I do have a good working relationship. Um, and uh, the Historical Society, you know, you, you still have to acknowledge the history. Like that is a thing that happened, right? And, and some people loved it and it is what it is. But on that property that I mentioned having um, recently sold and when they took off the, the pent roofs, I actually found myself wondering if... Um, the former building owner was upset about that because that he did that he helps with that that was his vision and now it's gone and there's no evidence of that and so um i actually heard recently thanks to um someone who's on our call today uh that it turns out the property owner is thrilled with the changes that they've done to the building so he actually likes the fact that the that his work went away um so hopefully everyone else is as enthusiastic about those changes <laughs> okay next um is a or oh, a comment about the state historic preservation tax credit. The, the commercial portion of the new tax credit opened to applica applicants on June 15th at 9 a.m. And the demand was so great that it closed after five hours. Um, so please call your le legislators and um, Michigan downtowns benefit from the kind of investment and um, they need to hear from you. Lindsay, will you reflect on your own legislator support? Well, I'm lucky to have Senator Wayne Schmidt in uh, covering my territory. And so he was the one that sponsored the bill and helped kind of reinstate the, the state historic tax credit. Um, very much a cheerleader for that, which is has been fantastic. So um, I didn't have to convince him. He obviously someone else had already done that. <laughs> um, and so uh, we are fortunate, yeah, that we didn't have to make those types of calls. But certainly, as far as how much funding is available, I think the the, the demand is very clearly demonstrated in how much um, attention and applications came in. White knuckle, like so I was sweating because as soon as 9 a.m. hit, 
you had to, you know, I had all my answers for the grant application, like in a Word document, copied and pasted them. I submitted our application at 906. And I know for a fact that someone else was quicker than that. And um, it's a first come first serve type uh, setup right now. So uh, there was a lot of pressure <laughs> around that process. And I hope that we, uh, we can acknowledge that there needs to be more funding there for sure. Okay, next question. The Venetian Festival is fun and really a draw. Um, what are some of the challenges and benefits for preservation of the downtown to absorb that enormous number of people each year? It's happening right now, Janet. I wonder if, um, if, she, if she's in the area. So, uh, honestly, I, I feel like Charlotte Boy does really well kind of I mean, we've experienced this influx of people in the summertime for over a century at this point. We've been a tourist destination for that long. And so um, when it comes to just infrastructure and um, services available, like we, even though we have a very small year round population, we cater to a much larger population most of the year with second homeowners and of course visitors. Um, the Venetian Festival does a really good job kind of blending in with the rest of the downtown. For example, the carnival is set up in the back parking lots of, of our downtown. So not necessarily, um, you know, obtrusive aside from taking up valuable parking spaces. Uh, but I think it just kind of uh, blends together and adds to the fun and character of the town overall. So. Next question. Curious about those who were anti-history. How did you work to convert them into fans? Um, I don't know if I've actually converted anyone into a fan of history. I think the thing that speaks loudest is telling stories. When you have interesting information about a building, that you can share with someone and you know that building maybe they've owned it for years and just didn't know that um, it automatically becomes more interesting and they automatically start paying closer attention to the detail and the craftsmanship and the you know original intent of you know who built that property um, and I think the the stories behind the buildings is what is um, easiest to connect to regardless of uh, uh, being a fan of history or not. Um, and, and that's what really uh, gets people to start paying attention. So interpreting that history and um, just getting it out there is, is probably the most successful way of doing that, at least here. So, Could you please say more about the Re Rehabilitation Ready program? Just how ready do you need to be? And please say more about the application process. So I could talk days about that program and it's um, the redevelopment ready certification program. But if you go to my place, miplace.org, you can read everything you need to know about the RRC program. Essentially, it is a very tedious process. I've heard a lot of municipalities balk at having to do it because you have to be formally engaged and or certified to be eligible for a lot of the state, in, um, state incentives that I mentioned. And um, that's essentially the MADC's way of having a, a carrot at the end of the stick, right? Um, they also acknowledge the, the fact that it's a lot to accomplish. You have to update your zoning ordinances. You have to, you know, just essentially be more transparent, make sure that your city website is easy to navigate so people can find information they need, um, make sure your site plan review process is streamlined and doesn't cause further delay. There's so many things that go into becoming RRC certified. It took us five 
years to get there. So um, it's definitely not for the faint of heart and you definitely have to have good partnerships on the local level to accomplish some of the things that the state expects. Um, but they've created this program to make us more successful in the end, right? Um, and so it's definitely a positive all around. It might seem tedious, but it's so worth it. And it's definitely a great journey. So I encourage you to look into it. <laughs> Okay, um, another question um, the attendee said, I think you established one of the spaces that provides office spaces for short term hour by hour use. Is that popular? Oh, I think um, so they're referring to we created a co working space, um, which generally speaking is a private business, but our program started it as a public entity because we have a huge demand for it with um, a very transient population. And especially during the pandemic, it proved useful since so many people have been working remotely. Um, and so, it, yes, it's very popular. We um, oversaw it for its first three years, and now we've actually transferred ownership over to the Chamber of Commerce, just because they have more capacity and more staff uh, to manage it and keep it going, so. Okay, one question from Eileen Tyler. What can be done about the loud noise of being on Main Street? <laughs> um, it is hard to sit at an outdoor cafe next to the constant traffic, especially trucks and motorcycles. Yeah, Eileen was recently here, um, so that's probably fresh in her mind. Uh, <laughs> I just happened to see her walking down the street one day when I was driving, so it was kind of fun. But anyway, um, so we have US 31 running through our downtown. So of course, that's a major connector between Traverse City and Petoskey and points north from there. Um, and because of the geography of Charlevoix, we have Round Lake on one side of our downtown, and then we have Lake Michigan on the other. And then Lake Charlevoix, which is the third largest inland lake in Michigan, is <clears throat> pretty substantial, spans a lot of uh, ge uh, square miles, I should say, and makes it so that Charlevoix becomes kind of a funnel of activity that's um, going north or south on this corridor. And there isn't really a way to get around us that makes sense. Like you can take the ferry in Ironton to cross over Lake Charlevoix and cut your trip time if you're headed to like Boyne City or places over there. Um, but essentially what it does is it's really kind of a bottleneck situation. And then we have our drawbridge, which makes traffic back up and congested and all that fun stuff. So because it's an MDOT road, we can't not allow large commercial trucks to go through. We can have um, ordinances in place that encourage good behavior, uh, but even when those are in place, people aren't necessarily following them and it's super hard to enforce. Um, so unfortunately, we're constantly gonna have to try to kind of create a buffer between that noise and the activity on the sidewalk um, to create a more pleasant dining experience because there's plenty of outdoor dining opportunities here, but you certainly do find yourself yelling at whoever you're sitting with <laughs> at certain times and it's um, unfortunate, but it's something that we're working on long-term of course, so. Hey, I see no open questions and Lindsay's um, contact information is on the slide. So please write that, that down if you, oh, you know what? I just see one more. It's Janet. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lindsay, so much for your time today and sharing your knowledge with us. And I hope everybody had a good time. I really enjoyed your presentation. And um, for everybody, this... Um, uh, webinar is being recorded. You will receive the link to the recording tomorrow and um, feel free to share it with other people that you should think will be benefit from it. And um, just very quickly, um, our next webinar is scheduled for August 18th. And the topic is Project We Hope, Dream, and Believe.
the Malcolm X House. So we hope to see you all next time. And thank you everybody for participating. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.